Welcome everyone to the first Joypack um, webinar. And uh, let me start with welcoming our guests here. We have Riley from Umami Games. Hello. And Khaled from Super Plus. Howdy ho. Um, and let's start with some, and I'm Falco from, from Joypack. Uh, let's start with some quick introductions, I guess. Riley, do you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and then also about Umami Games specifically? Yes, I'm Riley, and I'm the CEO of Umami Games. Uh, we make hyper-casual mobile games for the mass market. And uh, me, as a background, I'm very interested in game design, of course, and also marketing and the business side of things. Oh, Kalle? So, yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm Kalle from Super Plus Games. I'm the CEO of the company. Uh, we are a small developer from Helsinki, Finland. Uh, what we are famous of is maybe probably the Heels of Steel game, which has now uh, 40 million downloads globally. So uh, maybe some of you hopefully have played the game. And currently we are uh, developing Heels of Steel 2 and uh, our take on also our third title, our take on Battle Royale genre, Bros of Steel. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I'm Falco. I'm with Joypack. We are... Uh hyper casual mobile publisher. We're based in both China and Denmark. Um, and we are yeah, working on games for all markets. So we're publishing games directly in China. Um, I've been doing that for a while. And now we're launching more and more games globally and working with partners from kind of all over. And even though this is kind of like a Nordic centric uh, group right now, I would say that we have pretty international approaches to things. And um, yeah, today we want to talk about game design. And I, I, I love that you two are here because you pointed it out a little bit in your introduction. The kind of games you are doing is a little bit different, right? So we have, on the one hand, Umami is like very hyper casual, um, kind of like super mass market games. And then um, Hills of Steel and like games like that are a bit more, bit more core, have a little bit like a bit more of an advanced meta. And that is kind of like things we're seeing growing closer and closer together, right? Like a lot of people are talking about hybrid casual and how meta is introduced in there. So I think there's a lot of a lot to learn when talking about game designs. It's like what is important in both of these kind of segments and how do they go and how can they like go together? Um, but let's start at the beginning. If you have a new game idea, like where do you your ideas come come from? I'm not a game designer, so I'm very curious. I heard there are kind of like two approaches. One is like, I have a good gameplay idea and I try to make a game around that. Or on the other hand, I have a cool idea for a setting or a theme or a story I want to tell. And then I come up with stuff that fits uh, to that. Color, how do you handle that in your company? Like, where do you, your ideas come from? Or how do you start working on a new game? Well, uh, when we go to practical stuff, like I usually, uh, Maybe I start by saying that I don't actually uh, kind of like ideas don't matter. I, I would start with that. So, so what I mean is that it's the execution that matters. Everybody has ideas. I have like maybe 50 game ideas in my like written down in documents, but they don't matter at all until we actually do those. And when when I go to actual like design process, I usually I don't even think about the story or, or the game concept. I usually start by actually thinking about the objectives that I want to achieve. So, so at the same time, I will think about the demography, like uh, what is the target audience that I want to make a game for? And while I do that, I, I think about the kind of ob objectives, like I call them game elements. In a high, it's like a super high level concept that I start to categorize. And when I have some kind of idea that who I'm game, making the game for and what kind of elements I need to do so that uh, the game concept is, is able to do, be done, then I start to actually only then writing the game concept. And then when I have high level concept in my head, then I will kind of start to split down into features. And that is kind of the, the process that we do. Of course, sometimes, you might have a really concrete gameplay idea, but uh, and you start to build stuff around that. But usually, uh, I think that's not the optimal way of doing it. But start actually from the top and then going down from there. That's how I kind of like prefer doing stuff. 
Okay, cool. So a very analytical approach, kind of like already knowing where you want to get uh, to that, right? Is that the same for Omami or do you have a different approach? I would say it's a bit different. Um, of course, we would also look a lot at the, the game mechanic. Uh, in Hyper Casual, it's uh, very much one core mechanic. And then, of course, you also have some obstacles uh, uh, depending on which kind of genre. Uh, but we have started on settings sometimes as well. But I would say kind of in the as Kelly said, that that can be very, uh, that, that can be kind of a trap because you, you don't have a real great design behind it or like a good mechanics that will be satisfying and stuff in the end, then the setting doesn't really matter. Uh, so I would definitely also look, look at the mechanic first, try to get step down more than the setting. Um, but, but I would say both approaches could, uh, could uh, it works. But if you do the setting thing, you definitely need to focus on which mechanics would then fit for the setting. Uh. Cool, yeah, so, um, and then if you say you have a more analytical approach and it doesn't really depend on these things like that majorly in the beginning, did you ever kind of switch one of these parts out completely where you had uh, already a structure and maybe a setting or a gameplay that fit that? And then you figured out, ah, this is kind of not working that you didn't just, all right, completely different setting, same approach, we're still uh, aiming for the same audience, but we need a different setting for that or gameplay um, in that, for the matter. Yeah, yes, definitely. Like uh, approach can be changed many times, and and, and stuff like gameplay and the setting. Every everything can be changed. But uh, if you uh, start with kind of the high level stuff, then those are the objectives uh, that you need to kind of achieve, and they don't actually. Uh, you can have different kind of gameplay. You can have different kind of setting uh, within that really super high level frame maybe i'm this uh, maybe even too abstract topic to talk about or uh you know in this short time but maybe i can give you some examples so if i for, for example if i see that uh in near future there will be let's say battle royale game trending or maybe it makes sense to do that okay so what kind of audience is probably going to play that sort of games what kind of elements you need to have you have to be able to co op with people or maybe there is some social elements other like leaderboards or or stuff like that so i i try to think like what kind of uh, yeah elements you need to do and then when you have some idea of those then then you need to actually uh, you go down but yeah i, I <laughs> did i answer the question properly but <laughs> I definitely like uh, the gameplay and setting. Everything can be changed, especially in the beginning of the project. Yeah, we have uh, that changed out as well uh, because of like sometimes in Hyper you also do a lot of CTR tests where mm -hmm. you don't really have the game yet. You just have like one mechanic and, and a setting, and then sometimes like the setting is what really attracts. Uh, but perhaps right. the mechanic needs to be changed. Oh, you start a design and. When you'd actually play, we do like two, three days prototype, playable prototypes, test it on someone and find, okay, people are actually the intuitive thing to press is something else than what I originally thought. Then, of mm. course, you need to change it as well. Um, that, that's pretty interesting because, like, those, those things that you mentioned are very, like, things at first sight, so things that you see right away. What Kala is more, was more about, like, elements of the game, things that matter more to the people that stick longer with the game. And I think that reflects pretty well the approaches of having like the more mid-core-ish approach um, of having something that is um, more built uh, to have people stick in the game um, while hyper-casual is a lot about like getting people into the game, right? So mm -hmm. I, I'm very interested to see how that will, how that will combine. Um, if you have an idea for a game like that, is it always like one person that comes up with that? Is there a designer? Do you personally do that and just think of something great? Is that more of a group effort? Um, when do you get other people involved? I think like uh, usually you have some somebody who holds the vision, so to say, but uh, but still like uh, I think like it's always a group effort. So everybody put the ideas ideas in, and, and I think like uh, in idea. Uh, context of, of, of discussion, like uh, ideas don't have ego, so so I, it's always a, a group group uh, work. So it doesn't matter who uh, who has the idea in a way, but uh, if if the idea is good or not, then that that matters. But uh, I come to that uh, retention and stickiness part. 
So yeah, definitely like uh, because uh, CPI is is going up uh, in like when you go look at the industry in longer term. So that kind of requires often that you your retention is pretty good. So so the, the, this is the challenge that while uh, there are so many games being published every day, uh, so how do you make your players to stay in your game instead of maybe 100 other or 1000 other? So how do you make uh, your game as a hobby, so to say, to some player? Uh, that that is uh, that is like keeping me awake in the night times, uh, like as a joke. Maybe sometimes it, it actually does, but literally. But but it is definitely like a not easy task. But uh, that's why I I prefer not to start with thinking about the gameplay itself, but about the kind of like. Uh, the main thing, like what what I'm trying to achieve by doing this game. Why do does this game exist? Uh, what is the reason that I actually have to make this game for players? So yeah. Cool. Uh, how does it work at Umami Games? Do you come up with the ideas uh, together, um, and then um, yeah, maybe like when you come up with the ideas, do you already think about the long term, or is it right now purely hyper casual? It's like it's more about getting people into the game than keeping them around. So the structure we kind of do it is that we have these internal brainstorms. Uh, so doing that, and normally one person is like, as you say, Kelly, the division uh, holder that comes with at least like the mechanic. And we also have a lot of focus on the setting as well, uh, and like the mechanic and the setting. But then, of course, everyone's ideas and inputs are valid. Uh, we do try to make sure that it's still it's like gets one direction so it's not a mix of all different kind of genres and and stuff um so, so i would say it's it's a mix definitely yeah uh, we do think a little bit i think it, it like hyper casual in general has shifted a bit from starting late i think it was 2018 to now having a bit more depth in some of the games and more meta layer we're talking about the whole hybrid casual um so it's definitely something we're starting to think more about like what could be done with the long-term retention and the features, uh, as Kelly said, how could I make this game a hobby for my players, right? Uh, I think that's a very good uh, quote. Cool. Uh, yeah, you both mentioned the, the vision holder, right? Did you ever have um, a situation where, like, you, this, this, this vision and this passion has to be sometimes transferred onto the other team members, right, to get everybody as excited uh, about a game. And I know that from a publisher's point of view, that is often one of the challenges, especially in the bigger uh, publishers, kind of to get, because the ideas also there come from outside, which is like even a further step, right? And getting everybody really behind it and excited and be at their creative best, I think there, there needs to be a lot of passion behind that. Does that just work naturally for you guys? Um, or do you have any special techniques to get the other team members on board? Yeah, I want to highlight that it's really uh, important that everybody is doing the same game. So so that's why it's really super important to talk with all the team members like every day and talk about the new features, especially about the whole, about the whole vision of the game. Because easily when you don't you have this alignment uh, dilemma or issue, then uh, some people start to do that sort of game and that other team members will start to do that kind of game and then where when you actually start testing the game, people are surprised that, hey, I know I didn't mean at all anything like this, and then you have a big issue. So, so I think it like a real like proactive discussion is, is super important. Uh, uh, but then like uh, still, uh, yeah, but this is the basic dilemma that uh, should there be some sort of like a super director or lead or, or a person like this who basically has the vision and just goes forward and um, and and that's it or should it be more like democratic uh, i think like uh, uh usually like it is good that you have a uh, definitely like a lead who who is responsible of that vision and and um, but in that scenario it's not the point is not that uh, he or she has all the ideas and and nobody else can have ideas but it's more about the kind of like a vision holder that uh, uh, he or she makes uh, make sure that every everybody's aligned i think that, that alignment is is maybe in the center of, of this discussion in my point of view 
Yeah, I think alignment is super important as well. Uh, that everyone uh, <laughs> creates the same game, <laughs> for sure, as you say. Uh, what was the question again, actually, Falco? So, Is like, getting the... everybody in the team involved oh, yeah, and kind of like similarly excited about the yeah, project. Yeah. For, for because it's not, not necessarily their idea, right? Like sometimes it's you, you're, hey, okay. I have this idea for this super cool new game. How do we get everybody else fired up? Yeah. I think for us, it's least because Hyper Casual has so many different uh, real life kind of themes. We've had a lot of these very girly themes. Uh, and uh, the two programmers at Umami Games are both very hardcore males. Uh, so that took a little convincing. <laughs> but I do think if you have a lot of passion yourself and if, when you're conveying the idea, if, if the whole connection through the idea makes sense, other people can feel the passion as well. And there can be other like technical passion stuff. Like, uh, for example, with our folding clothes, uh, there is a lot of technical stuff, stuff that's pretty cool to make, even though perhaps the theme in itself is not your favorite. But I think mm. if, if people can see the entire narrative, they can become more passionate as well. Um, and in, in the end, also, people should also make games. You shouldn't make a game you hate making, or you don't. Right. <laughs> So, uh, of course, it should, <laughs> should also lead to you as a person. But I think, uh, especially in hyper casual, like every game is a challenge. Uh, okay, cool. Let, let's let's say, all right, everybody in the team is on board. You really believe in your idea. When is the first time you show that idea to somebody else? Like, and and who do you show it to? Um, is it like just during the concept stage? You show it to friends and family already? Um, do you wait until you have a prototype? Uh, do you do any kind of like focus group testing or anything like that? Um, like when do you start showing the idea to other people? Uh, do you mean like uh, within the company or outside the company or? Uh, outside the company, or at least outside of the group that is actively working on that that game, right? So within the, the, the team, you have agreed like, hey, that's the, the game we want to do. Um, and then you go ahead working on it. Do you then like with that idea, uh, go out to people already or do you start building by yourself and up to what stage do you build and then who do you go to yeah well i think like uh well in our company because we have only like 12, 12 people there so it's uh this kind of like second home environment so it's uh we always talk with even like new game ideas like every day and it's it's this kind of casual casual discussion and it's not so like uh, we don't have like a uh, strict processes in that way but uh, of course like when you actually start to do stuff uh, like even like prototype then that, that that's already like bigger thing because it's already uh, some sort of like investment in time and work and, and, and money so so that kind of stuff we don't do that easily you can always talk about ideas and concepts and so on and, and uh, yeah, jiggle with ideas, but uh, when you actually start to do stuff, we kind of, uh, when we do prototypes, we aim at least to do it in a way that uh, we first do mock-ups, they can be videos, they can be images, and we test those out, those out in, for example, in Facebook, we check the CTR in those, uh, those uh, different kind of sets, then we pick up the winner and do the prototype based on that. And that goes forward when we actually uh, go to prototyping, we maybe make like three set of prototypes and then again pick up the winner and then start doing the soft launch uh, production with that. But all that also, maybe I'm going a bit to beyond the original question, sorry for that, but uh, what maybe this good phase still to highlight that we, what we want to do is we want to create some sort of like a data funnel. So basically it's data funnel in a way it starts already uh, by the uh, potential player seeing your ad of your game. Uh, so then you can measure the CTR of that. Then we can measure the store conversion percentage. Uh, did he actually or she already like install the game or not? Did it, about the app store, uh, sorry, app start uh, tutorial competition, uh, playing one, two, three games. Uh, how does that go forward? And kind of the final step is the first purchase or maybe the fifth purchase. And then we can, when we have the data of the, the whole funnel, then we can 
see where's the turning point and we can optimize those. So that is kind of when we go from concept or idea kind of forward. That's how how we that, that's the goal of how we try to work. Of course, sometimes it doesn't go quite like that, but uh, that's kind of the goal. That's that's very interesting, um, especially the the point that you said. Like we're testing something before we actually work on it in a prototype, right? Just in a video, because really that is something that hyper casual studios do a lot, right? Or like uh, that yeah. at least a few a lot of publishers also talk about, because that beginning of the funnel is so important um, mm -hmm. that like getting over that stage, um, you can basically test that before you make any any games. Do you do it the same? And then like how else do you do you get feedback for your ideas early on? Yeah, I would say the same with the CTR testing as early as possible, even with a video as well, um, uh, just to make sure, as you said, that, that the entry will be at the right place. I think it's super cool that you in Cali, that with bigger games, because I thought about that, how you do that in bigger projects, uh, how you can, because for us, it would be probably be a new game idea, each CTR test, uh, more than it would be the same uh, gameplay in various versions. Um, so that's definitely something we do. Uh, we also try to make like a, a two, one to three day uh, playable prototype and test it. Normally we sit in this open office space, so there's a lot of people just to test it on uh, super early. Um, I would though say in hyper casual, it's also hyper competitive. So I wouldn't show it to too, too many people because it's so easy to uh, and quick to copy. So I definitely wouldn't send it out like live and say, hey, look at my new cool prototype before knowing the metrics myself. Uh, cool. That's talking about oh, yeah, go ahead. That point has actually been always interesting. Like how do you see the market? Is it like super competitive? Like just are people ripping your ideas when you yeah. actually okay. Uh, it's definitely hyper competitive. We also we're talking a lot about like uh, making a crappy first version for the App Store first because there's so many bots just tracking at uh, different platforms, also trying to track new releases and themes. You can also go into the apps library on Facebook to look at what are people testing and stuff. So yeah, it's super, super competitive. And with all the data coming in, um, do you do you keep track of that internally? Do you have kind of like a data base where you put that all into and do you take that into account uh, when you come up with new ideas or is that just more something that is like collective consciousness that you kind of remember when you're thinking about new ideas it's like how analytical are you um, about the, the the data from previous tests when you're going into a new game well uh, I, I actually like that term collective consciousness that's really yeah it, it like uh, well it depends like uh, yeah, if you are like uh, improving the already existing game, or or when you actually start to do the next game, kind of how you transfer that knowledge from the first one to uh, second one. For example, in our case, we have Hill Steel One. We have we are making Hill Steel Two. So it's uh, we are every day thinking that uh, some things that actually work really well in the first one didn't quite work in the second one, or or the other way around. So it's you can cannot always transfer the uh, learnings because uh, when you make di different kind of products but uh, yeah definitely like uh, how do we check the data is that uh, we try to discuss about that uh, with the whole company as often as possible because I think when we discuss about the motivation for example actually it even uh, boosts the motivation and especially like developers they see that okay let we made an update and it actually made these and these players so much happier. So it's, I, I think uh, data is king in that sense as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would totally agree uh, with data <laughs> being king towards that, for sure. I mean, from, from our uh, perspective, um, we, we, as I think it would be a great idea, actually, as you say, <laughs> so I got to write more down, but since it is, different gameplays, uh, a lot of hours. It can be hard, as you say, Keller, to translate it from one game to another. We do try for each game, though, to, to track the game itself, if we make, mm -hmm. so it had a good CPI, then we do different retention tests, and we try to track that to what worked and what does, didn't work. Because um, sometimes you can get surprised, you think you have a really cool uh, thing and doesn't <laughs> go the right 
direction. There are in hyper casual also a lot of people are trying. I think Iron Souls tried to make like um, genres beneath the hyper casual. Uh, so there are a lot of people trying to um, to kind of categorize it more. Um, there's also some platforms like the Coda platform that tracks different uh, gaming mecha mechanics and stuff. Um, so I think people are working a lot on that. They would like it to be easier probably to just compare all the games. This would be the next thing. But the thing is it always changing so much. I don't think it's as easy as uh, one would think just to... <laughs> right, yeah, I, I totally, that's the, the same for us as well, that the um, App Store categories that most of them designed 10, 15 years ago at this point uh, kind of don't really reflect those genres and then it's hard to go by data. Um, by that. You guys mentioned a couple tools. Um, I want to get, get back a little bit to the game design uh, process itself. Um, but talking about tools, do you have any tools um, that help you kind of like write out a design document? Do you just do that as kind of like a, a Word or Google file or something like that? Or is there something specifically for, for game designers um, that you would recommend to keep track of all of that? Well, uh, we use just like Google Docs and that's it because there you can uh, uh, draw charts and stuff like that. So, yeah. Do you have uh, something else? Uh, yeah. So we use Trello for like basic project design. We actually also use Paint a lot <laughs> for the mockups. Uh, we have some other programs as well, but it just seems like it's the fastest way to get something over. Um, I guess uh, the Coda platform as well, but that's more for market intelligence where it, it lists all the newly released games and which mechanics that you mentioned a bit are going up and down on the charts. Uh, we also use a cool tool called Smart Look, which I'm super happy about, which records all the session in, if you say, Kelly, if I make a test flight and then test it on some people, it will record all the sessions so I can see how you actually played. Because uh, normally people don't, they're not always honest. Like people lie, data don't lie. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Yeah, of course, it's like, it's it's so, like uh, outside the design, uh, so of course, like we have Firebase for analytics and we have App Annie to check other games, revenue downloads and other charts and th this, these sort of tools, uh, apps player for attribution and so on. But, but yeah, definitely like uh, if we like uh, compile like design documents, just Google Docs for us, but, uh, but also like uh, interested to see like if there's some other tool for that, but yeah. And yeah, actually sure. for us as well, uh, Cloud Build and then uh, the Awi links, which is kind of like a test flight thing, just where you don't have to add people in the this in hyper casual, everything is so fast. So uh, there's a lot of these tools just making what you can do in other ways even faster. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, that was the same for like publishers I've uh, I've been involved with that. Uh, um yeah getting the stuff out to people and then how do you track what they're doing they're not necessarily always lie but they also are not as aware of what they're doing often um so like tracking somehow what they're doing in game i think is an interesting an interesting bit how much would you say we talked a little bit about earlier about like trying out new things and collecting the data if they work or not um if you would look back at a couple games you did how close is the finished game to the original idea, and how much does it pivot into something completely different? Yeah, well, uh, maybe I, I could actually start by uh, by, that, uh, by telling that about our, about our very very first game before Hills of Steel. Even uh, we made this game called Retro Shot. That was the first game that uh, our company did uh, when we founded the company, and it actually was a total player failure like it didn't fly at all. So uh, uh, with that uh, game, for example, we changed it to design like all the time and, and it didn't actually work out and we didn't manage to kind of solve the design issues with that game. And, uh, and that's why uh, it was a, such a story. But uh, learning from those mistakes with our first first game, when we make Hills of Steel, we actually, uh, Surprisingly, it was the same game, kind of the same game that we had originally uh, in our heads. Uh, of course, like uh, content-wise, there's lots of different kind of content after that, but the basic core of the game and the meta game was actually designed 
uh, like super fast within one month or so, and it actually stick into that in the later phase as well. So yeah. Yeah, and in, in hyper casual, I guess like with the with the size and the speed of those projects, it's we're talking very little incremental changes, right? Because otherwise, you probably call it a new game already. Yeah, yeah, we would probably just throw it away if numbers wasn't there. Uh, of course, it it would depend on like, do you have a low CPI or high retention? Because if you had a high retention, you would try out. We have tried that before. A concrete example could be something that has a top down view. Uh, it was like a, a basic uh, kind of pipe, pipe dreams kind of game. We have to change stuff. We had a top-down view. Then we tried changing it to an isometric view, and we cut down 30 cent on the CPI, which in our case made it then possible to actually uh, <laughs> to, to scale it. Uh, so we made some of those kinds. Of, we also tried with different like visual backgrounds, uh, but I would say the core gameplay is pretty much the same. Uh, in, in the beginning or the end? Well, maybe one, one thing I could mention also that uh, while well, Hills of Steel is already like almost three years old game, after when it, when it was live for already for one and a half year or maybe two years already, so that's like what one year ago about, we actually did change the meta game uh, quite heavily, which was really risky because we already back in those days we had probably like 300k uh, daily players so mm -hmm. we actually start to redo meta game um, game economy while you kind of do live ops for that sort of game it was a huge risk and uh, but we decided that okay let's play let's do it and we did it in a bit like a hurry for certain reasons and uh, all the players didn't like it at all. So we got like a bit of like a backslash of, of doing that. But of course, like in the longer end, it turned out to be that, okay, we made uh, good changes and it was good that we did it. But uh, uh, this kind of community reaction type of thing is also uh, something that we didn't even quite expect that people can be quite uh, angry when you change their favorite game in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's going to be very interesting going forward with hyper casual, right? Having to think mm -hmm. about all these elements. Um, the other way around, though, Riley, what would you uh, say is something that like hyper casual studios have like like unique challenges um, that you had that then um, kind of like the more tra like more mid core kind of studios could learn from about your process when it comes to de design, but also just like handling the games. I think now, like it sounds like uh, Kelly, that that your company has a, a very cool um, way of doing things, testing early. But I would definitely say that's a thing a lot of people could learn from from more the more the mid core hard core stage. Kind of yeah. feel like the approach you mentioned seems very valid because I've just seen a lot of friends using two three years on a game, never tested it, just assumed that this will be the new big thing, and you're almost broke when you're done, and ah, and then you yeah. find out. Oh, People didn't like it as much as I had hoped, and then and perhaps you could have tested that after three months or a month or something. Uh, so I definitely think that would be the most valuable thing. And also something about like how easy is it to pick up? You can have a mechanic that can be more deep on the long, but how easy is it actually to to uh, to in to interpret what the game is about when I see it? Um, I actually like uh, there's that's excellent topic that you brought brought up. So about that uh, kind of like the scope handling and, and, and never testing and, and so on. I, I actually want to talk about that because uh, I don't want to be a kind of dream breaker, but uh, sometimes I, I, I kind of uh, feel sad that I, I see some uh, sm really small indie developers and they have put their kind of heart and soul into some game for, let's say, uh, three years or, or something like that. And you can clearly see that, okay, that's, super nice that you are so you know uh, you have the sparkle in your eyes when you do that sort of game and it's like a this kind of like hobby project almost and you put your whole life into it but at some point uh when you are when the scope is uh not actually matching your kind of like budget or finance or team size or something like that or uh, team structure then 
what might happen is that you end up spending like two or three years on a project that will never ship or after it does ship it doesn't quite fly because you have never tested the game so i think that's uh something that uh indie developers we should learn more uh the te testing i yeah so thanks for pointing that up because i think that's super important it's like a fine line between design and the business side of it uh i have some people saying oh it's great that you care so much about the business side but perhaps that's also because i care about the design side knowing that the design will never live if it doesn't yeah if it's not sustainable i think um, it's a good marriage like those should be in a way a bit together yeah that's kind of interesting like but how do you find the right middle ground on that right as from from my experience talking to a lot of developers and them showing me their game is uh, the extremes are definitely uh, somebody who is like oh yeah it could be a mobile game could be a pc game oh free to play premium let's see like we keep that open on on the other hand there's the one that like oh this is my vision this is the the piece of art that i'm working on i'm not going to show it to anybody until i'm done with it um and then i'm going to unleash it on the world right and there is a middle ground, but how, what would you recommend for studios like how to get to the, the right kind of in between of those two extremes? Yeah, of course, like uh, like we discussed, like testing early is uh, solving part of the problems. But of course, I, I do understand when you make like huge PC game, for example, uh, you cannot just test it uh, that easily um, part of the game uh, early on because the game is can be huge. So how do you actually arrange this testing? I do understand that, so it's it's not that that easy. But um, I think uh, it's it's kind of the ma maintaining the scope of the of the production. So uh, I would say that uh, if somebody finds their uh, own company and and make their first game, and if your first game uh, your first game production lasts over one year. Uh, I, I think you should be a bit worried at least that are you are you actually sure that this is the way how to do it? Uh, and I think hyper casual is excellent uh, kind of genre, especially in this kind of things because you can you can make games like uh, within I don't know uh, two months or uh, or so so more even faster. Some companies do it even faster. So and uh, speed is king in that area. So I think I think it's really interesting market and, and uh, tempting uh, for many developers. Yeah, I would say also like having the right team, perhaps someone on your team will care more about the monetization side. And when you're designing, someone is always thinking about, oh, we need to think think about as well. I've also heard uh, examples from people doing more PC games and more mid-core, hardcore, that they use Facebook groups. I think you mentioned a bit about it as well, Kelly. Like doing simple videos just to see is this is there any kind of traction? Are people reacting even if you don't do a real campaign? Are people liking that? Are they clicking on it? Can I find? I've heard one guy say very smart when he creates an idea, then he creates some videos and tests it on different platforms organically to see can I find a platform that where my game is popular. If it's not popular on Reddit, if it's not popular on Facebook, if it's not, then perhaps I'm not really hitting any groups at all. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that we we see that see that a lot with like super successful games, especially right that they got started like by by posting a GIF on Twitter or something like that, and that's a good way to kind of get feedback in a non-traditional way. Like you don't have to go to a, to a focus group company or something to get that that early feedback. Um, do you have any when you design a game? It's kind of like things uh, like some some the best do's and don'ts, like three things that you always should keep in mind when you start designing a game and three three things that you really try to avoid to kind of not um, create problems that might like carry into the development of the game as well. It's like from the outset, the the, the top do's and don'ts for game design. Yeah, I actually, uh, yeah, there are, well, the testing, testing side uh, on the do side, uh, uh, definitely, like we talk about that many, many, uh, many times. But I think it's it's not only about testing, testing, but uh, creating this kind of uh, data funnel in a way. So 
uh, think about user experience as a kind of like a data funnel. I think this might sound a bit boring from uh, traditional uh, game design point of view, but uh, to me it's not it's it's not boring. It's uh, more like exciting. So to actually see how players uh, behave uh, within your game, I think it's really exciting. But I under, I do understand that uh, it can be sound a bit boring. But I think the importance of of building that sort of funnels is super important and and you can even uh, create this kind of like a different kind of audience audiences audience types that you want to track so this sort of audience will probably behave in your game this way and this in this way and and that kind of maps to game design as well uh, what else like when de designing games i i think i already mentioned that there's no no ego uh, in in the room so uh, always the best idea to win. So it doesn't matter who, who is who is saying the idea about. It's more about the the uh, content of the idea. So that's because sometimes I have seen teams that where there is somebody who uh, just is the loudest people in the room in a way, and then wants to just okay, this is my game, my idea, and I don't listen to anybody else. So that kind of process in the longer end uh, leads to really bad games because you don't maybe get all the input from different people so it can be a bit dangerous uh what else uh i think like uh yeah the execution is is, is the king so uh, uh uh always focus on like when you when you design for example games don't just make like uh, design documents and nice presentations but actually when you add a new feature for example to a game make sure that you uh the user experience on the feature is really good so you actually see how that is integrated to the game uh every ui thing every feel look and and, and so on so that so uh walk through the whole thing not just like uh, write a task jira or trello but uh, actually see how it goes <laughs> very important and then um uh what else uh, yeah one thing i think uh one uh uh element that every game uh designer who is a good game designer in my my world is that uh it is really super important to be able to jump into players shoes so what i mean is that when i make a game i'm a game developer i have a different kind of hat on but uh it's super important to also like put that hat off and Put on the kind of player hat and try to play your own game uh, with the player hat on. So maybe then you will see see your own game differently. And that is a skill that is not easy. I, I do understand, but it's at least good to try that. That is some news at least. <laughs> or maybe yeah. tend to. Sorry for that. <laughs> I agree a lot with the last thing, like being able to see. I think even in hyper casual, where we all talk about it's mass market, there's no uh, target audience at all. Which for me as a designer, I have a, a, like a background in design as well, uh, with game design. That's a bit weird because that's what everyone has like been putting in your head. Or like always have a like a persona, as you say, a target audience. Uh, but I would say in hyper casual, there would still be some persona types. Like, are you the type that likes these satisfying games where perhaps you're playing TV? while you're playing it, where you don't even have to think about the game, or are you more the type that wants like a specific ex excitement in small bursts? And yeah, so I would definitely say you could still make personas in hyper casual, just in a different way. Um, I would also say like my do's would probably be test early, as Kelly says as well, uh, and even like before you would think it was possible, <laughs> even. Um, I would, an example from us, we have seen some CTR tests with crazy results super early. Um, so if we have made more game out of that, we would still have gotten the same result. In this case, we just saved 10 days instead of using, uh, yeah. Um, otherwise, I think you mentioned it earlier a little bit, Kelly, so mockups. That's a huge do for us, for both, like both the different features, but also for like a general game idea, because sometimes uh, you don't have the same image in your head. Uh, when we're talking about a design, we have talked about a lot of different designs. Uh, but I think it's super important that you're on the same line also with 
like angles and placement, how do we, because sometimes technically it's not possible, or it, it just won't feel nice um, when it comes down to it that way. Uh, otherwise I would say scope, which is kind of both like a do and a don't, right? Do set a scope of some sort and uh, don't over scope it. Uh, also I think you said it a bit uh, earlier, Cal, as well, like thinking about your team size as well and what are you interested in, what is actually possible for this team and this in this budget? Like if I only have money for a year, I shouldn't plan something for three years. Uh, and regarding that, I also think it would be super cool if you have a project for, that would take three years, could I create some kind of MVP that would show just the core of the experience? Like in six months to test whether does it have promising early metrics? Um, other stones, I think in hyper casual, there is this fear about uh, like starting with the setting when you're designing. And we have seen a three of these low CPI, but also super low retention kind of games, because there really isn't much game in it. It looks fun, but if it's just the same very, very repetitive thing, and you don't really have an, a, an, a design direction, where do you want to go in? Uh, sometimes it can be very hard to, to force a, a, like a gameplay over a setting. Um, that's kind of a don't, and, and don't assume as well. That, that you know, you're the user, just as you say, have the player head on. Um. Cool. Um, can I uh, add one thing? I just came up with this, uh, because I, I've been talking this uh, with our team quite a lot, is that it's super important that uh, when you add a new feature, you have to really uh, think, like, why does that feature uh, exist? So so it's not, not only when you add a, when, when you make new games, uh, so you have to think like why why does the market need my game? But you can also like uh, go a bit down from there and think about when you add a new feature. If a developer thinks that's only that okay, I I got this idea and this is this is gonna be so much fun. But if that is the only argument that uh, I think this might be maybe potentially be fun, I think this again sounds a bit boring and sounds uh, something that a business guy would say and. Yeah, in a way, I am a business guy, but but, but still, but still, like uh, there should be some sort of uh, analytical thinking that why does this game need this feature? And so whenever you need add new new stuff, then try to go that process through. That uh, what is this new feature gonna improve? Why why do, do the players love this game more after this feature? And and so yeah, this one I wanted to highlight still. I think that's true. Like about keeping like the balance between being analytic and being like creative in a way, because uh, it is a very, like making games is something creative. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's a very much about finding that balance, makes sense. Awesome, um, yeah, we're almost coming to the end. If anybody has some question, make sure to, to post them. I can see those here in the question category. Before we jump to those and to give people a little bit of time, we already have some question. But to add some more, um, I have one more thing for people that just want to get into game design that are completely new to it. Nowadays, there are some like, you can actually study to become a game designer, uh, but there are also other ways. I, I always hear different things. On the one hand, I hear studios saying, oh, a good game designer, it's the hardest thing to, to get, like a really hard to, to, to find employee. And on the other hand, it's kind of like, oh yeah, everybody has ideas for a game. It's more about like, can you program them or sketch them out? Are you an artist? Like what else do you bring to the, to the table? What do you recommend for people that want to become game designers? Should they focus on that and become the best in that um, education wise or otherwise, or should they find another kind of branch into the games industry and then inch towards design from that? And where to find the right resources to that? Are there any good uh, tools, books, courses, like ways of studying it um, that you recommend for people to go down? That's actually a really uh, difficult question in a way because I, I think to me, uh, uh, what I, I I would first ask what is game design and what is a game designer because uh, traditionally uh, game design was about figuring out game story, game characters, game mechanics, game controls, but now there is like a, all sort of stuff on top of that. So it's not not only about that. So. Uh, uh, like I think game designer and in some way game producer also it's so vague uh, title and role that I, I think like that's part of the problem why if somebody wants to be a game designer 
uh, it's really difficult to know uh, what are the areas that uh, uh, should be focusing on because it's so it de depends on a, on a company and on a, on a project and, and, and so on. So uh, yeah, it's maybe you you are wiser in this. I, I think that's actually a really difficult question. <laughs> I, I think so as well. I would say it also depends a lot on, on the project. For example, in hyper casual, I would say like the game design, like the game designer in the end kind of needs to be a programmer as well, because uh, they need to make a technical prototype for it. Uh, if it's a larger company, I know uh, I used to work at Texas Games. They had con a specific level designers only designing levels. Uh, I know from other companies that their designers. Um, are also visual and so it really depends. I would say being able to create prototypes of some sort would help a lot. There are tools like a build box, uh, which is even without any type of program where you can play around with it, get a feeling because the execution as Kelly says is super important. I would also look at the deconstructor fun. They have some great articles, uh, free to play Bible, um, and also teaming up with a publisher. Uh, of course, that's probably not when you're all new, but publishers normally have a lot of information, data, and connection, especially in hypercaching, will teach you a lot of stuff about becoming a better designer um, and, and start making some games. If you want to become a good game designer, you should start executing. <laughs> I think like the, the last part, like uh, well, about the reverse engineering games, that's actually excellent voice. Point like a good practice can be that you pick up some games that are super successful and you you uh, start by thinking why they are successful. You you start to split in that maybe to game elements that the term that I used, but you can you can split it to game features like what kind of features this this successful game had and 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 start to uh, make a picture. You can even draw a chart uh, of the all the game features and how do they map to each other. And uh, you can uh, draw pictures of game loops, core loops, meta game loops, uh, reward loops, and, and with those kind of tools, you can try to understand the player behavior and, and about the success of that game. Maybe I think I think that actually yes does help a lot with game design. There is lots of books, of course, and, and uh, trainee positions in in many companies. Uh, so well, yeah, doing games is. Uh, it, it's important to play games, but doing games is even more important if you want to be a game designer. So yeah, totally agree. I think it makes sense. And we did that. I remember at ITU, uh, I, I took a, actually a master in game design there. Uh, we did that as well, analyzing both bigger and smaller games. And I would bet you, and especially in hyper casual, if it was in kind of the same genre, you would see, as Kelly says, so many of the same. That, uh, that the stuff that keeps being there, or oh, there's a fever mode of some sort. If I do well, I get tricked something that makes me play even better, and you will just see a lot of the same same stuff in it. I would say like if if you take more like the business, like the job approach kind of stuff, it's not so uh, many years ago since I finished <laughs> my master. Like a way is also just as soon as long as you get inside a game company. Whether it being in social media, whatever kind of skill set you have in art, social media, whatever, normally, like internally, if it has some sort of size and you're good at it, you can change role over the years, maybe start as a level designer, become a producer, get even more. Um, so there are many different approaches depending on your skill set. For example, I, I started as programmer, but then I, I uh, turned it into associate producer first and then the producer. And I was producer for a long, long time until I, I founded our, our company. But yeah, there's there's many ways of, of doing this. So, all right, let's get to some questions. I have two that are actually kind of related to each other, and then what you just said about um, looking at other games and breaking them down and getting inspiration from them, maybe also for your own games. Um, do you still do that? And then, how much inspiration do you get? Do you like? Because especially in hyper casual, a lot of people are talking straight up copying about games. How do you react if somebody copies your game? And uh, do you take like if they add new features, do you take that back into your games? Like how do you handle uh, influence from other games? How much do you look at other games? And how do you feel if like people take from your games? For us at least, I mean that that was actually one of my perhaps don'ts. Like don't be afraid of failing. 
and don't be afraid of like we have tried that uh, a lot of times seeing the theme we create like the, the game we created that theme being changed a bit and then being published by someone else we have also seen like pure one-to-one -one copies it hurts but at, at least we are trying to say to of course you need to hide your stuff for as long as possible um but we also just try to say to us that the, right now this is happening to us but in two years when we have way more experiences we will be the ones to see a prototype say, hey, if you just change this and this, this will be a huge success. Um, so kind of trying to, but there is still a lot of copying. I would definitely keep keep it close. And we are also looking so much at other people's stuff and uh, not copying, but we, we want to try to mix more different game mechanics and see if we create something new. Um, it's definitely a thing. Kelly, you mentioned about like, working on on like this open heart surgery that you sometimes have to do if a game is more of a kind of like a game as a service model um do, do you like get inspiration for these other mechanics from other other games have you ever seen somebody who did like a similar game and added something that you really liked and thought about hmm, maybe we should have something similar in our game well do you want to well well for the first question uh, i i want to say, say sure. that hills of hills still one uh has been copied like I don't know 10 times 20 times so I have seen so many copies uh, out there but uh, normally like we just we actually play those together with our team and we okay okay this one did this and um, uh, yeah it's I think it's it's some sort of like uh, uh, we don't kind of mind about it and it's it's actually even fun to play those those copycats sometimes and of course, if it's if it's uh, too straightforward, so it's one on one. So some some developers have actually uh, one on one copied our art assets and and audio assets, and, and then it, then it a bit hurts, and 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 you are like, uh, okay, dude, come even try, you know, it's it's that's I don't I don't like that, but uh, we have seen that as well. Uh, and, but uh, Hills of Steel One was. Uh, it, well, now it has online elements in, into it, but uh, in the beginning it was an offline go game, game, so it was much easier to copy and and, and so on. Now it's a bit harder. Uh, for Hills of Steel 2, that, that's also one of the reasons why we make uh, multiplayer games, is that uh, if somebody wants to, for example, copy Hills of Steel 2, well, good luck. So we have spent <laughs> two years making that game, so it's, it, it's not that easy, it won't be that easy. So. So I think that, uh, like, also lifting the barrier uh, for that is, is, it can be kind of business decision in a way. And it's a little bit na and the name of the game, right? I mean, at least in a hyper casual, like, you just need to be fast and secure your stuff. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, we have one question about working with a publisher as well. Is um, if you work with a publisher from early on, like. Um, how do you work together? Do you start new game ideas together? How often do you communicate um, with a publisher? I mean, if that's for us, I mean, it depends a bit on which publisher. I mean, I think every publisher has their own method for doing things. We tried out a couple of different ones and stuff, uh, but normally it would be something like you come, like either they have ideas that just hand to you, and it's kind of like a work for hire thing. Thing we have mainly created our own ideas um, that makes more sense for us. Then we uh, have some mockups and we have a Skype meeting uh, with our publisher already before actually starting creating the games. Uh, we would also do at least a weekly publisher meeting with the pub just to make sure that they're following the production and all goes well. Um, but but normally you, you you don't talk that much. Uh, depending on which publisher, they also have some um, different learning opportunities. Let's say uh, different how-to videos about design stuff and principles and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, I view that as as a service. So basically, if we use a publisher, uh, uh, we first think like, what do they have offer uh, that we don't at that stage for that product? So. If we find that there's a good marriage in in that way, into some some case, then then it makes sense. So how how, do, how does uh, go then? Then of course it depends on a game and on the on the producer. Uh, sorry, the publisher and so on. So so yeah, I think there's no single one way, but uh, it really depends. 
There's one question about where to get influence from. Um, and I think for hyper casual games, we see that a lot of um, like inspiration coming from very everyday kind of like household traffic and these kind of things. Um, how about more more mid core games? Um, like, do you get inspirations from other media, from other kind of games, board games, and so on? Um, like outside of other video games, where do you get inspiration from? Uh, tough question again. Uh, of course, like uh, uh, I think, like uh, there is no uh, maybe there's some getting too philosophical, but. Yeah, but I don't. I don't think life as a you know like you have work life and personal life. I I think we all have life, so one life. So uh, that's why uh, all stuff that you do is it evening time, morning time, day time. Everything comes together in a way in one package. So all movies, music, other games, sport games, everything, books uh, does give influence, but. Uh, uh, what is like kind of more most important one? I think mostly uh, uh, other games that are kind of close to uh, what we want to build in a way. So there, there, there are many like for example mobile games. I'm a big fan of. So, so I, I do those. I, I play those not only like from reverse reverse engineering point of view, but also as a fan and as a player. So. Um, uh, maybe those are the biggest learnings. I also heard people talking about like how many percent of innovation do I want to put in this idea? Like if, if you're coming up with a new idea, I want to make something that's, let's just say, close to it. It's a solitaire game and I want it to be close to, I think this is the one called Dream, something, a solitaire game out there. Then maybe yeah. I'll say I want this many percent of the game should look like from this uh, game and then the rest should be a twist something innovative or something uh, kind of to, to, to help you a bit with uh, the inspiration. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's something that we had at Publishers I work for that we said like 70% familiar, 30% new. The 70% doesn't have to come all of one game, but it kind of helps people to ease them into the experience and then still offer them something on top of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have one lot. Oh, you have at something about about the innovation in general like uh, you can innovate in many things you can innovate in team you can innovate in controls mechanics story characters uh, so pick your innovation of course like in audio level you want to innovate in all of those but uh, there are there might be some some areas where uh, it's easier to do uh, used kind of standard ways for example monetization might be one one of those because uh, players for example, in mobile, I used to pay for certain type of stuff. So if you suddenly rip that away and you uh, try to teach the players new ways uh, what to buy, for example, within a game, that that can be tricky. But uh, I don't I don't say that it it shouldn't be done. I'm just saying that it, it can be challenging. I think that's a very good a valid point, Kelly. Like always thinking innovation versus risk. But of course, if I innovate on in all the areas as you mentioned, uh, Kelly, then that would be a huge risk, right? Uh, so you can kind of minimize the risk a bit by looking at stuff that just works. But while, while of course, you, you have to always bring something new to, new to the game. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> we don't want to, nobody wants to copy, just copy, copy, copy. But, uh, Opportunity and innovation are kind of connected there as well, right? So by reducing the risk, you kind of um, reducing the opportunity a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. okay. We have a bunch of good questions about things like like CPIs and these kind of things, um, monetization. We're gonna have some other webinars coming up that are specifically more about these uh, parts. I want to close it out to something that is maybe a little bit more uh, connected to design and like the design decisions throughout the throughout the development and also something that I feel will highlight the differences between the more hyper casual approach and the bit more um, long term approach a bit. Uh, a couple of people asking about stages like how long does it take from the idea to the first prototype? Do you have something like a like a beta test in hyper casual um, like through what stages and at what pace do you move a game until it's like out and then of course for um, for games with a longer term ambition what follows after that? 
um, not in super detail, but just broken down, like kind of the stages and the timelines and how much changes do you do from one stage to the other? Yes, I, I think from us, I would say first stage would be, yeah, of course, that's the brainstorm, but then first stage would be playable prototype. I would say one to three days. Then it's funny you said, Kelly, I think you can make a hyper casual game in two months. I would say that's a very long time to use on one prototype. <laughs> so I would say playable prototype uh, three days. Then first, um, and you can all, all already do a CTR test after the three days uh, if you want to get like an early feeling of that. Then I would say playable, like prototype testing. Depends a bit on the game, but between two weeks to a month, uh, it depends a bit on how much technical stuff there is inside of the game, but at least for the first test, I would do that because I would just do a straight game uh, game mechanic uh, test, uh, having like let's say ten levels that you loop. I wouldn't use time and all. I would just check how, how popular is the, how promising is this mechanic actually in its core. Yeah, in our case, like prototypes. Uh, because now we do only like uh, multiplayer games, so uh, even a prototype is is can be quite. Uh, yeah, we cannot do those uh, within like one month or, uh, but it's more about maybe three months or so. So we can actually get the technology to work. So uh, PvP actions work between players and and stuff like that. But uh, even like I think uh, three months of to test something is, is, is fairly okay time still. Mm -hmm. I think this comes to scope management like we discussed it before. So. Yeah, I would say the same with hyper casual then. If you know if the core is super promising and, uh, and for us like the core would be at least day one and day seven looking promising, then depending on the game and how much meta layer extra feet skins and stuff, there will be a lot of monetization stuff on it. Maybe a, a couple of months. Uh, the faster, the better, right? Because as soon as your game is out there and being tested, at least in hyper casual, there's a chance that someone else will see it. And uh, so it could be from like, could be one month or two months after the idea came up, it would be launched and ready to be scaled. Cool. All right. Then, um, do you have anything else to add to add for your fellow game designers, for aspiring game designers, or any other kind of like? Thing that you wanted to to say about game design before we close it out. Well, uh, do you have something in your mind? Or... Don't start, oh. hell. Start. <laughs> I think like uh, I don't know. Like uh, I think myself as a young boy when I was playing with Commodore 64, and uh, of course, like for me, like making games was uh, like like a dream, and I didn't even realize when I was a kid that you can actually make games for a living for living when you are adult and, and, and so on. And so I started to just make those at some point and turn it out to be a programmer and producer later on and, and so on, and now CEO. But uh, uh, I think it's, uh, like we discussed it, it's, it's just like uh, start doing those, uh, important to play, but more important even to start developing those, those yourself. So and uh, uh, there can be a group of people, maybe within your school or, or uh, well, there are training positions and, and all kind of ways how to how to do this with friends and so on. So just start making games. Yeah, I would agree a lot on that. Start again. Don't be, especially in the habit. Don't be afraid of like it's better to take a decision and try something out than not to make a decision at all. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. awesome. Yeah. Then uh, thanks everybody. Like, of course, thank. To the two of you for for uh, like giving us your time and talking about these uh, things. Thanks to everybody. I saw over a hundred people at one point uh, watching us. So thanks to all of you guys. That really motivates us to do to more of these. And as I said, we have a couple more to come. Um, we'll try to to answer more questions in any way possible. If you ever see us at any conferences once those start happening, or just reach out to us. Um, I mean, uh, also the, the other two, I guess, will always be happy to, sh to share this kind of things. Um, for us, of course, we're a publisher. If you have games, <laughs> approach us with those as well. Uh, if you're a publisher, you'll probably be interested in, in um, contacting the other two. And um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's it for today. Uh, we are going to have a recording of this online at a, at a later point as well. If you want to rewatch it, probably going to 
put some comments under that when it comes to linking to specific um, tools and resources we mentioned, because I saw some questions about that. And then thanks everyone, and I hope I see um, everyone back for an for, um, upcoming webinar in the future. Take care. Have a good day. Take care. Bye. Bye.